Welcome back, guys, to the Bear and Scully podcast with me, Sean Scullion, a.k.a. Scully, Owen Mallon, a.k.a. the Bear, Aiden, the face for radio, behind the scenes, and today we're joined with Ashley Gallagher. Hi, yeah. Welcome to the show. How are Ashley, you? thank you very much for coming on. <laughs> it's, uh, look, you need to chill out. I know, relax. nerves is a wreck. <laughs> <laughs> no. nerves wreck. We don't, all good. We, we don't bite, and I should be the only jittery one in this room. A long weekend, but Hi. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for making the track down. Oh, actually. no worries. And we're going to get into it. But before we do get into it, it's nearly becoming a standard in the Burn Scully podcast that we, we just let people know that some of the, the some of the conversations we're going to have mm. can be quite triggering. Yeah. And we're going to include some links and hubs. But hopefully, not just triggering, helping. Hopefully it'll help some of you and help know that there's hope to go through some of these situations yeah. Yeah. but uh before we do all the serious stuff which seems to be our thing now <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming more of a counseling Let, let's 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 go back till the very start actually and where you grew up and and I family was born in Derry, and i lived in Derry until i was 13 and then my parents uh was relocating us to luton luton where and they were taking over a public house, a bar. So we moved when I was 13 and we moved into a bar and we lived up above the bar. We lived there for five years. So it was a big change uh, moving to a new school, new environment, especially being from Northern Ireland too. I went to like a, a Catholic school and it was a mix of boys and girls. And it was a lot of Irish descendants and a lot of Irish family. But because I was actually Irish, I got kind of picked on a wee bit about my accent or the way I spoke or things. So eventually I kind of changed my accent a wee bit. I did come very english fight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and much to my mommy's disgust <laughs> when she would hear me on the phone in the bedroom talking and she'd be coming in going, get that accent off. <laughs> um, so we stayed in the bar for five years. Um, I... Unfortunately, I fell pregnant at 16 and I suffered a loss. I uh, lost maybe baby Erin uh, a month after my 17th birthday. She was stillborn, unfortunately. And I was in a very abusive relationship as well. The dad was very abusive. And so when that happened, my parents realized that living in a public house and everybody knowing your business and, and stuff that it wasn't substantial anymore to raise a family so they decided to give up the bar um when I was 18 and then I started relocating to London and I started working for um London Underground so I was working for London Underground and when I was about 21 22 I met my husband my ex-husband and so we um started dating and then we moved in together and at the time it was I think I had quite a low self-esteem at the time when I met him I think he realized there was vulnerabilities there in me because of what I went through before and prior uh before that so he was 10 years older than me so uh we moved on together I thought love in a bucket finally going to get me happy ever after going to get my family that I always wanted and my children that I always wanted and so we um started as I said discussing marriage or and I was like desperate really wanted to get married wanted to get engaged kept pushing him to get engaged kept saying I want to get engaged. so we were dating for about two years I'm together for two years and then we went to Paris and I remember <laughs> Typical woman throwing the toys out of the pram. We were there nearly a week and I was all here. This is not happening. Where's this engagement ring? Why have you not proposed it? And we had a row the night before because I was sulking because I thought, right, he's not going to do it. He's t- no. But the next day we got up and it was a April Fool's Day. <laughs> so we went to the sack of car and I marched 10 miles ahead of him, still having the hump that... Nothing was going to happen. So got to the sack of car. We went inside and we both sat down to look around. And the next thing he said, well, what about it? Are we going to or not? And I busted out laughing. I was all, yeah, it was so quiet. 
So he's like, right, let's go. So we went outside and as soon as we went outside, there was like a door in between the two main doors. And this person reached over and started knocking the knocker. I don't know what it was, but me and him was there. And the next thing he got down in the knee and I thought, see, if he pulls out this ring, I'm going to be mortified <laughs> after being such a bitch the night before. <laughs> Excuse the French. So he pulls out the ring and he was all, well, were you then? And I was like, all right, let's. So we got engaged on April Fool's Day. So uh, we decided then we'll get married on April Fool's Day. <laughs> Two years later. <laughs> No waiting about. Why no. not? Says it all. Um, so we got married. To, he was from Scotland. He was Scottish. And we got married two years later. It wasn't a very joyous occasion. My mom and daddy, my mom especially, wanted me to get married back home in Derry, where all the family is. Catholic wedding. He was non-religious. He didn't really support the church. Catholic. Um, and to me, at the end of the day, love is more important than getting married in a church or do you know what I mean it was easier for me to sacrifice my beliefs or my so we got married in a hotel registry office and to be honest with you deep down there was a load of red flags leading up to the wedding anyway our journal relationship screaming at me screaming at me don't do it even the night before my wedding I knew you kind of don't do it but again, my stubbornness, me, all oh, things will be grand, I'll be all right. Um, went ahead and done it, got married, and then started trying for the baby. And I had a few health conditions. I suffered with endometriosis and stuff. So, uh, but thankfully, a couple of six, seven months down the line, I finally fell pregnant. Uh, about a year or so, I fell pregnant. Around about Christmas time, fell pregnant. And then our first daughter came along and then we lived in London we had a wee flat it was like a three-story flat so it was kind of hard going down the prams and it was just I wanted a house I wanted a home so we then fell pregnant with my second our second daughter and we decided then to relocate to Scotland where he comes from so the decision was we were going to re I was going to relocate with the two daughters and he was going to stay in London. London and work, continue working. I was obviously going to be on maternity because we worked for the London Underground, we worked for the same company. So I was going to relocate and then eventually after my maternity leave was all up, hand on my notice. And so I re we relocated uh, a month before my due date. So... I knew when I was going to have her because I don't go full term and I was being monitored really closely. So went into have her and he literally then just became a more of a distant person. He would come home to Scotland and cause rows and she was only a couple of weeks old. I remember it was a really snow. It was in the December and we had the bad snow in 2009 before the snow in 2010. And I got a phone call to say that my uncle passed away. So obviously I couldn't go because I was newborn baby and I remember him causing a row, like just picking, making a row and he got under the car, he switched his phone off and got under the car and drove back to London. That's what he used to do, he used to come up, have massive rows, switch his phone off and disappear back to London for days on end. I don't know when he was coming back, where he was going to be, this, that and the other. So, um... That went on for about a nearly up to the summer, the August. Chloe was just, we decided then to buy a house in Scotland. So we started looking for property to buy because we were renting in Scotland. Plus we had our own property in London. So we said, right, we'll look for somewhere to buy. And we bought a house. And we got the keys in the October, so it was a year of me living there and me home with the Gares. His family lived close by, but they weren't like kind of a close knit family. So we went, moved into the house, and then again, things. He literally basically wanted us to live together as parents, but no marriage. That was his. And we things, he was, the flat was going up for sale. 
so we decided to sell the flat and he was going to rent like a bed sit in London um so it was coming up to near me giving my maternity leave so it was coming up to the June and we're in the house since October so that was about nine months or so Mm -hmm. so he then had the flat up for sale and he started talking about this girl the name he was constantly obsessed talking about her and I kind of knew her we worked together when I worked in London but he was constantly from the the April 5th wedding anniversary in the April my mum and dad came over for the weekend to look after our two daughters so we could go away and celebrate our fifth wedding anniversary and we went to Glen Eagles and that whole weekend, he was very distant, very distant. And funny enough, that we were in his car, he drove up from London and stayed at his mum's the night before our wedding anniversary. I didn't even get a message to say happy wedding anniversary. I knew he didn't want to go away because it was me that was pushing for us to go away. And no one people say, have you ever found hair or found, I actually found a piece of hair in the car, like long blonde hair. And I was all, and I was dark at the time and I was all, and the, the gear that, she did have on here and I was all right. So again, alarm bells was ringing. There's something not right here. It's not adding up. So it was Muller's, it was our wedding anniversary was the same weekend as Muller's weekend. So my dad went back to England and me and my mum on the Sunday was celebrating Mother's Day together. He took the children, the daughters to his mum's house. So we went out and spent the day together, had a few drinks, spa, afternoon tea dinner really lovely day and I remember coming home and it was just at seven o'clock at night and I had a great routine for the girls the girls went to bed every night at seven o'clock great routine and I he wasn't in the house so I happened to phone him and I was all where are you and he was all I'm at home and I was like you're not at home he's a what he was a wild wind up merchant he knew how to like press my buttons and uh he was all I'm at, like my like I'm at the house and I said you're not at home I said, I need the girls back now because I need to get them ready for bed, put them on the bed. But he was niggling. And then he came back. Me and my mum, was in the house, getting a, waiting for a Chinese to come. And he came in the house and he actually just started picking. And a whole row broke out. He went up the stairs and grabbed my eldest daughter, our eldest. And he was down, storming down the stairs. The baby was on bed by then. And he said, I'm going to my mummy's. And I said, what are you taking her for? And he like, pushed me out of the way because I wanted her to stay. I was all... So he left and went over to his mommy's. So my mum said, look, I'll go over and get the way. So she went over to get... And apparently a whole ruckus broke out. I wasn't there. So my mommy came back to me and she was all, look. And I said, no, I want I want her back. So I went over to get her. And the next thing when I was walking around the house, a police car pulled up. And a policeman got out of the car. And a female police officer and... He came over to me and he was all looking at me and I was like saying, hello, how are you? And he was all, are you intoxicated? And I was all, what? He said, we were told there was a drunk lady here. He goes, you're not intoxicated? And I said, no. I said, I'm not. I've had a couple of glasses of Prosecco today. I was out for afternoon tea. And he was all, I, right. He goes, what's going on? And I said, I don't know. So we went down to the house and the next thing he comes down the stairs and he was all, your husband's accusing you of attacking him. And I was all, what? I was all, what do you mean? He goes, he has scratch marks down the side of his neck face. And I was all, I was in disbelief. I was all, is he actually being serious? I said, I didn't even go near him. I said, what are you on about? I said, he could have done that to himself. I said, look, I don't, I said, look, at the moment, our relationship's not great. I said, it's become very turbulent. I said, I have a feeling he's having an affair. And I said, there's something not adding up. And this police officer was taken, and the police officer said, look, your daughter's cell, she's sleeping. She's fine, she's okay. Just let her stay here the night. And this, that, and the other. And uh, he goes, look, he goes, can I give you a wee bit of advice? And I was all, yeah. He goes, if you're going to pursue this, he goes, don't use a sluster in this town, because it was a wee small Scottish town, he said, don't use a sister in this town. He goes, get yourself a sister outside of this town. And I was all, what do you want? It, it was as if he was warning me. 
and so not in, like straight out but in kind of so he said I've told your partner to bring the child back to you tomorrow at 10 o'clock and if the child's not back you contact us and we'll let you we'll come and get her I was like right okay no problem so he left and the next morning my ex messaged me and I was all look we need to talk I don't know what's going on I said we need, and I was adamant I wanted to make my marriage work I had two children I don't want to come from a broken home. I don't want them to come from a broken home. I've already gone through so, um, so much before. And so me and him went and had a chat. And we decided to keep going. But again, he just wasn't... He was just not the man for me. Or is He put me through so much that it, I kept going back anyway. So anyway, then, uh, the June... So that was in there probably in the June, then things really did come to head. Then he was, I handed me notice on the work, we were just uh, resigned from work. He was going to then be the breadwinner. I, he's, the flat was being, going through the process of being sold, and <laughs> there was no intimacy in the relationship by then. And I was craving that as a woman. Sorry if anybody. Um, no, don't be sorry. So I was craving that as a woman. And <clears throat> he was coming back from London that weekend. And I remember getting the house all nice and clean and tidy and getting right. We're going to the night. You know what I mean? There needs to be someone here. And I went out for a walk with a friend. And um, I came home and got the kids on the bed. And I went down the stairs and got a bottle of wine. And. And he just wasn't interested. Not interested at all. And I literally just lost it then. I was all, he or she. I said, is it her? I said, there's somebody. I said, I want yurt. I said, I need yurt. I said, we're done. I said, or else we're going to marriage counselling. One or the other. I said, so the next day, he got up. He was going back to London. He left. Never heard from him. I messaged him to say, look, I've made an appointment to see a marriage counsellor on Monday when you're back up. He never acknowledged it. And he was all, I but it's you. No kind of twisting it. It's all your fault. It's you that's doing it. It's You're causing the argument. You know what I mean? And um, so I was like, right. So the next thing in, he came up and he went and stayed. No, he said, I'm on my way up now. And I said, well, you can stay at your mum's. And he was like, no, I'm coming home. He said, I'll sleep in the sofa. I said, that's not a marriage. That's not what I want. He goes, I, but you wanted to be a mum. That's all you always wanted to be. You only wanted to be a mum. And I was like, no, I wanted a family. Um, again, he was turning it around to me. So we decided then, I I went, you know what, no, I'm locking the door, locked the front door, put his bags, the toiletries that he had at the house, put it on the handle at the front door. And I remember in the middle of the night I hear in the car pulling up and my anxiety was like, my nerves were wrecked. I always went from the start and he, I heard him coming to the door and I heard him trying to open the door and then I heard him getting back into, slamming the car door and getting back into the car. So he, I knew then I was going to stay at his mum's. So the next day I messaged him saying, right, we have an appointment today at the marriage counsellors. I'll meet you at Edinburgh I'll get the train on the Edinburgh and I'll meet you there no I'm not seeing a marriage counsellor and I was all why do you obviously have a Sunday height I said because they'll see right through you same way I do and I said but if you have Sunday tell me tell me and we can work through it nah um so I had stood at the train station and my train pulled up and I stood and we didn't and we didn't and we didn't and no sign in and the tra- I let the train pull off and my friend messaged me to say he's on the bar his brother, I was all right. So I stumped down to the brother and his, he came out. And I was like, what the hell? I said, are you not prepared to make this marriage work? I said, I'm here, my own, with two children. And you're, he you just, nah. Went on back into the bar. I went home. And I went, right, what am I going to do here? He, I had no money then because I resigned from work. I literally had bills still to pay. And I was all, what am I going to do? So my friend said, you're going to have to go and sign on. And I was all, I have never signed on in my life. 
um, what? So, and then my dad, I was all, my friend was all, you're going to need to see a sister. You're going to have to start now. If that's what you decided you want to do, you need to get the wheels and pro- process. So I remember phoning the sister then, look, I think he's having a commitment of adultery. And, and the sister turned around and said to me, it's going to be very hard to prove. You literally need photo evidence, messages. You need proof. It's not like the old days when they used to just say, right, there's ego, do you actually need physical proofs? And I was oh, right, well, how am I going to get this proof? And at that time, he sold a flat in London, so I didn't even know where he was moving to or who he was moving in with. He wouldn't even give disclose the address. Um, plus, he walked away with a substantial amount of money. And the sister in Scotland turned around and told me that I had no claim over that money because I'm in Scottish, I'm in Scotland. And because it's based in England, it's called, there's, can't quite remember the name, but he said that I had no, they had no jurisdiction over that. So he could walk away with that amount of money. That seems so strange that if you're a married couple. <laughs> yeah. And I paid, I was paying him from the day or an hour I moved under his flat. I was paying him a thousand pound a month, every four weeks actually, because mm-hmm. I got paid every four weeks for working for London Underground silver service I was getting paid every four weeks I was giving him a thousand pound every four weeks out of my money because we had not he wouldn't do anything joint he wouldn't do joint the bank accounts not him was joint the only thing we had joint was a name in the house in Scotland that was joint and see sorry just your solicitor so did you take the advice of the police officer or did you go to somebody else outside no, the I town no I stupidly went to a police officer in the town oh uh, a solicitor solicitor in the town yeah yeah S- uh, solicitor in the town I for me, gluttons used a sister in the town because and I just, I was too, I'm too trusting. I, I'm too trusting. I give people a chance, no matter what I've been told or what I've been said. I said, here, they haven't done anything on me. Do you know what I mean? That's your perspective. I said, but once you hurt me or hurt my children, then I, then you're right. I should have mm-hmm. listened, but I'm too too naive, as yep. they say. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And mm-hmm. and like that that's an equality in someone that should be admired, but it's also a quality in somebody that be exploited when ah. when when that sets in. But I wanna I just wanna go back on, on a few wee things. Yeah. The night that he had taken your daughter, mm-hmm. had he scraped his own face? Yeah. That's what I, they have a cat his mum has a cat and she's quite a dummy cat and his mum too would be very deceitful and I would say his mum would have supported him because things were starting to uh, coercive behavior yeah. I don't know whether that's coercive, coercive behavior it, it's, yeah. it's quite a calculated that, oh, that gotcha. they're mm. reporting you for being drunk mm-hmm. and, and and I want to ask you actually and it's not because I just, I know when people say alarm bells ring, sometimes it's not right at the time, but it's only afterwards when you look back at all them things, you're like, that wasn't right. So it's not, and, and nobody judge because a lot of times when, when we love someone and they're doing something like that, mm-hmm. we're, we're justifying it and we're, yeah. we're reasoning it. But when that all was going on, you weren't getting any love, you weren't getting any intimacy, and that you're, you're starting to get that gut feeling. Yeah. Uh, and, and your gut's never normally wrong. It, I'm a great believer now in following your gut, <laughs> regardless. But it, it sounds so cold. Oh, the, the way the way he treated you. Oh, he's very cold. He looking now, even now, he's. Was it? Was it? Was it always like? Were you? You know the way sometimes when you want something, you want you want your family and you want your marriage. What you what you're wanting. And what you're getting at the it never more, but you saddle sometimes because you think that's I settled. I had again, this is where it comes under low self esteem. I had no confidence in myself. I came across confident, I came across, but I was already in when I was in my previous relationship. That was a domestic relationship. I, seven months pregnant, he had me strangled in the bathroom, locked the bathroom door. It's more of a you attract 
it's not that you attract these things. I think it's because of, again, it's it's low self esteem. You feel like this is what you deserve. This is what you. That was your previous relationship where you, you lost your your baby yeah. when you were sixteen. Yeah. Because we we didn't go into that, but you were sixteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were pregnant. How, how far along in your pregnancy? Full term. I was 39, 37 weeks when she was still born. And did, did you, when you were 37 weeks, did mm-hmm. you know then? Were you told then? Yeah, I was n- nine weeks pregnant and I had a heavy bleed, unfortunately. And I was due to have my first scan the next day. And I phoned the doctor and he said, Look, it sounds like you've miscarried um but you still need to go to the hospital just to make sure that every so i remember going to the hospital they didn't take my bloods because they knew there was no point taking my bloods they didn't need to check anything and i remember going under the ultrasound with my mum. my partner wasn't even there he was kind of a bit relieved because he didn't really want he actually wanted me to have an abortion i didn't want to tell my parents that i was pregnant who would want to tell their parents at 16 that they're pregnant do you know what i mean i'm i grew up in a catholic home my mum's very religious. I was like, right, how? So the only thing, thankfully, it's not thankfully, but I lived in England. Completely different situation over there. Um, so I went to see the GP, told him I was pregnant. They said, right, we can arrange for you. If this is what you want. I didn't want that. I deep down didn't want that. I was not. Thankfully, um, a friend of my mum's discovered she had an uncle in that I was pregnant and she confronted me and said to me, are you pregnant? And I said, yeah, broke down crying. My mum happened to walk in at that time and she was like, I walked out and the next thing my mum's friend comes after me going, I can't go back on there knowing that I know. So either you tell your mum or I tell your mum, one or the other. I was all going, you tell her. So I ran up the stairs to the flat in the bar phoned my partner at the time and said look mum knows well he went ballistic he went ballistic why does your mum know and I said because I wanted my mum to know thankfully my mum came up the stairs she came up and she was all I can't sit here and have a go gee she had a picture of my granny and granddad I'll never forget it and uh, she was all I can't have a go gee she goes because if I'm having a go gee I'm insulting that woman there my mommy and I kind of went what she went your granny was 16 when she fell pregnant with empty I was all, right, so she said, here, these things happen, so no baby, we'll get through it, you'll be brained, blah, blah, blah. So nine weeks, went for the scan, the ultrasound, turned the screen away, and she was working away, and she, the next thing she turned around, she said, tell me this, she said, were you just over the nine weeks? And I said, yeah. And she went, look, there's a wee heartbeat here. And I remember turning the screen on, round, and I just burst on, I knew then, I wanted her, that's it. I want this baby. This baby's their son. This baby's going to do something for me. Like so, the next thing, um, I was. I knew there was something not right because there's no movement. I remember doing everything in the trick in the book that the midwives tell you to go get in the bath, check to see that there's any movement in the bath, do everything. And I remember going to my mommy. Something not right. My mum was like, you're right, you're right. And I was all, no, there's something not right. I need to go to the hospital. No, my mommy, it was Emmerdale. Never forget it. Emmerdale was on the telly. And my mommy's friend rang. And my mommy was on the phone to her friend. And I knew she went through something similar. So I said, mommy, go and ask her what she done. So my mommy was saying to her and explaining it. And she said, go to the hospital. Go in the hospital. Tell them she's not, you're on your way. So I was like, right. So I phoned to my ex-partner, his mum. There said, right, we'll meet you at the hospital. Went down to the hospital and went in their room and they'd done the Doppler first. Couldn't hear nothing. Put the, 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 the thing to the thing. Couldn't hear nothing. And I remember we were going, right, I need to get a consultant here. So she went for an ultrasound. And when they put the Doppler on, you do hear your own pulse. And I remember every time hearing my pulse going, oh. she went, no, that's your pulse. She said, that's not. And I was all right. So the next thing, she got the consultant, comes on, and he sits down, does ultrasound, and he literally just turned around, I'm sorry. Literally just went, I'm sorry, there's no heartbeat. And I remember screaming, screaming, get the baby out. Literally just going, get the baby out, get her out, get her out, get her out. I kind of knew it was a girl. 
I knew it was a girl from day dot. And I was all, get her out, get her out. I want her out. And he was all, I was that naive. I actually thought I would have went for an operation, cesarean section, whatever. And because I was only 17 then, so it was a month after my birthday. And the consultant said to me, um, no, you have to now give birth. And my mommy went, what? And he said, I, he goes, it's because in the olden days, the women used to go through what they went through, but they used to just leave the room then with the baby and the woman never. And it caused a lot of issues for women and they wanted then the women. So we went off. He said, you can go. we were leaving and they said, we'll take you to the room where you're going to have the baby. So they took me to a room. I'll never forget it. There was like a crib, a rocking crib. And I bought one two weeks before uh, from mother care. And I remember just seeing that crib and bursting into tears. And the next thing then, um, they turned around and said, look, we can, the midwife looked at my mum and said, look, she bought a crib two weeks ago. The same wooden walk and, and she said, look, we can move that out of the room. Um, so I was booked to come back on the 10 o'clock next morning. So I had to go home. They said I could stay on overnight or go home, but I didn't want to stay on the maternity. I had not money. So I went home and got up the next morning. I went home. Never forget it. I was in the bar. And um, coming through them bar doors. Thankfully, the main bar was there and the lounge bar was closed which they used for parties. So I went through the main bars and I had to go through the lounge to go up the stairs. And I remember collapsing and my mommy getting me a chair and getting me up and I could hear the bar and the people laughing. And and I remember having to sit and then going up the stairs. And I remember mommy getting a phone call to say, look, I mean, what do we do? Do we close up shop and send everybody home? Do we turn the music off? My mommy went, you have to carry on. We have a loving day, Mick. We have to, you know what I mean? We can't close up. We can't, we have, we'll be here supporting. So I went on to hospital the next day. Gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. And she was my biggest baby out of the two of them. She was actually, my two wee ones were five pounds. She was seven pounds. So she was chunky and I got to spend 24 hours with her and I left I'll never forget it the midwife actually gave me an option she was on the crib and the midwife said you have three options I can stay in the room with her and mommy daddy can go or we can take Amy now and we can go with her or mommy, daddy and Amy can have a long time in the room and it, mommy, daddy can go and she can stay in the room on her own. And as a, as a mom at the time, you don't want your baby on, on their own. So um, they, I made the decision to let the midwife stay. I said, you stay with her and we'll go. And I remember coming out of that room because I was locked in that room for 24 hours. I couldn't, but more, 24 hours I got to spend with her. But I was in that same room for overnight I wasn't allowed out of the room because again it was on the maternity it was like just down the corridor from the maternity unit and um, the midwives were amazing so was, I didn't even have pain relief and they were begging me to have pain relief they were like you're not having you're not getting anything at the end of this there's nothing for you at the end we can't see you suffer and I was on that I've always said I wanted to if, even if she was thin I was going to have her naturally that's the way I wanted it and that's the way I'm doing it so um we had to wait for a week then because the caretaker, the undertaker, sorry, came and took her to the wake house. And then I went to see her in the wake house. And then that was, she was buried then the week later after she was born. And then I stayed in that relationship for another 10, nine months. Stayed in that relationship. February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. I, and it was awful and it got worse. Got worse. Was your partner the same age? Slightly older, two years older, three years older. He was slightly older, but he was a he was a bad. He was a bad neck. Like, he was 
Aye, it wasn't very pleasant. Any man that puts a hand on a woman's not good. Mm-mm. Any man that puts a hand on a pregnant woman. Oh. Should do a long time. I would know it. But 100%. 17 is such a young, horrific thing to go through at 17 years. Yeah. Like, at 17, you think you're old. Oh, of course. When, when you get older and you realise you're still only a child. I was only a baby. Seeing pictures of myself after I lost her, I flew. She was buried on the 10th of February and I flew to Derry, flew home. Mommy, my auntie and uncle were celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary and my mum and dad already had it planned. They were com- going home for it anyway and I was due on the 21st of February. So my mommy was kind of a bit in two minds whether she was going to go or not anyway if I still had been pregnant because she didn't want to miss the birth of the, her grand, first grandchild. So I decided I'll go with his. I need a break. I need to go home. Need to see my family. So I took my ex with me and we all came over. And I remember getting on the plane and there was a baby on the plane. And I remember the baby crying. And the harder that baby cried, the harder I cried. And I remember the hostess, air hostess coming over to my mama and she was all looking, going, because my mom was thinking we have some tissues, juice, a bottle of water. And I remember the, the air hostess looking, going, is she okay? And my mom was said, look, she just buried her baby yesterday. And the air hostess, I could see her fist and she's all right. And as I said, the harder that baby cried, the harder I cried because I wanted to pick that baby up and cuddle that baby. And as they say, you develop empty arm syndrome after giving birth. Um, that your body knows that you're a mommy. And your body knows it uh, wants to get up in the middle of the night and make a bottle and wants to hold a teddy bear and ho- or hold that. And I remember getting handed a teddy bear and throwing the teddy bear across the room going, what good is that to me? That's a teddy bear. And um, so as I said, the harder that baby cried in the plane, the harder I cried. And I got home and I went to the party and seeing pictures back, my cousin showed me a picture of the, and I was like a ghost. I looked like a wee, still looked like a child. And I was pale. And I looked and I was all, I could see the pain in my eyes. And I was all, that's, even now I kind of look and I goes, that's not me. That's not, I didn't go through that. I didn't, you know what I mean? I'm strong. Um, Look, it's hard to even imagine. And we can't, we, we, we spoke to Ali I spoke to other podcasts. Mm. I spoke about my niece. I can't imagine the pain on a a 17 year old, let alone dealing with an abusive relationship. And the level of abuse in that relationship. Oh, it was, yeah. Bad luck. And that's obviously had an effect before your marriage. Mm -hmm. Because it felt like I, I'm used to, that's what I deserve. That this is normal. Being in an abusive relationship is normal. That's normal to me. That's normal way somebody should treat you. That's there. There is people that pick out people that have them vulnerabilities. Oh, he hundred percent, hundred percent picked me. I know that now. And you, you were young. You were young. I was young. He was. I was only. I was actually in a relationship. I met somebody prior to this, and he was. He worked for London Underground. He was a revenue control inspector. He was amazing. He was like, oh, best thing since sliced bread. Worshipped the ground. Gave me anything. But because I had such a low self-esteem, I sabotaged that relationship. I thought, why are you with me? I don't deserve you. And I walked away from that relationship because he was too... And I was actually with my ex-husband and it was before we even got engaged. And I, he actually came back, wanting me back. And I was like, no. <laughs> and my relationship, I kind of knew at the time that I shouldn't be with this person that I was going to marry. I could have. But again, that's my own self-sabotage. Because I, again, my low self-esteem, no confidence in myself. And it's like, I don't deserve you. So it's... What you're saying is very common. 
people suffer, suffer when, <laughs> when people are good to them and yeah. they're not used to it. They just simply don't know how to be. Yeah. But do you think then the relationship then with your ex-husband and then the way it all went, like I got the impression from you that even when you knew he was cheating, you were still willing to, to try and make that work? He was actually physical with me. Um, first time my daughter was just over the year we're in the flat in London and he was on night he was constantly doing nights Con- when my daughter was born our first daughter was born he was constantly on nights he didn't have to do nights but he chose to do nights and I hated that especially being home and you know what I mean I had to be we lived in a two bedroom flat and it was a tiny flat and so when he was coming on in the mornings, I felt like I had to get our daughter up and ready and take her out all day so he can get his sleep and get his rest so that he wasn't going to be disturbed. So when he, and I remember one night, he was obsessed with a game called um, EverQuest. Since the day in our I met him, he was obsessed with this game called EverQuest. It's an American game and it's like, uh, an interacting game. And they make characters and and stuff like that, and he was always talking to people from America, but there was, I, I always thought they're too far away anyway for anything to happen in that aspect, do you know what I mean, to have an affair with somebody from that side of the world, but he was obsessed with it, and that was the reason why he worked nights all the time, so he could sit and play that game, or have his time, he had set times that he had to go on, and it was like, I don't know how it worked, but he tried to get me involved, and I was all, I'm not, gee, that's, kids games there and I'm an adult here so I remember him going to do nights and I remember begging him not to go because it was lonely at night then too and plus postnatal depression set on with Freya as well because I bonded with her oh she was my world but I was afraid to lose her that was I, 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 I'm sorry <laughs> I, uh, this man had a baby at home and he was chosen the, the nights. Mm-hmm. It did work. Jesus. That's yeah. the fucking selfishness of that is unreal. You're at home with a wee baby on your own. Yeah. New mum. New mum. Yeah. But uh, even when you were describing to me about the Scotland, it just, I don't know, John, that, what, I, what you thought, but that, that set up to me seemed weird. For mm. and I'm not because oh, you're young yeah. and you're you're vulnerable. So it's absolutely in no way that I'm saying that to you. But I don't know a man that would have turned around and says, You know what? You take the two babies and go up there and I'll call up for the weekend. It's children are hard work. It's 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 a <laughs> yep. te- it's a team job. Like yeah. uh-huh. and a, any man that, that that says this is the best thing for and it's not honestly because actually for a lady, and and I can see the the the, the forgiven nature, and just <laughs> I, I can see that you just wanted your family. Yeah, but but see, just own saying there, you wanted your family. You'd obviously said there before you get married that there was the red flags leading the whole way up. That even on your wedding day, you said yeah. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want to get married. No, I knew he didn't. But did you think, like even your marriage and then having the kids, maybe them red flags again? Did you think that that in some way was going to fix you or repair you? As in, if we get married. It'll it'll make things better because we're yeah. we're now married. If we have because I I know I know loads of people ha- have have mm. spoke out and said that they thought that by doing these things would fix their relationship, mm-hmm. and it doesn't fix the relationship. No. It didn't at all. Did, he, did you feel like that at all, or? In his eyes, he always said, "I always want to be a mommy." Since I was a tut, I loved children, loved working with children. I actually, when I was pregnant with my first. I was actually studying health and social care because I wanted to become a social worker. I wanted to protect these wee vulnerable children and work with children. And because I just, I've always had a soft spot for children because maybe, I don't know, it's my own childhood kind of issues or whatever. Um, So I was like, I always wanted to protect them. And as I said, I always wanted to be a mommy. Always wanted to be a mommy. And they... Started studying health and social care while I was pregnant. I was going to college while I was pregnant. And obviously then I lost the wee one and my heart wasn't on it anymore. I couldn't. I tried to go back the second year and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't work with children because I was suffering with my own um, loss. And 
So then, as I said, I got on there really, fell on there a really good job in London Underground. Pay was amazing, working for Silver Service. I was only 19 years of age when I walked into that job, landed on my feet. Could have made a career out of it. And as I said, I met the fellow that was, that I self-sabotaged the relationship. And he was Revenue Control Inspector. And again, as I said, and... At the time, I w- after we did split up me and the, the fella that I idolised, um, he my there was an instant. My parents was away on holidays and <clears throat> I tried to take my own life. And I phoned the partner that I didn't think was good enough for me phoned him told him that what I was going to do and he phoned an ambulance and the ambulance came and got, took me to the hospital thankfully I managed to bring everything up um but at the time he phoned my work to say that I obviously wasn't going to go into work and it was actually my husband my husband to be answered the phone so he knew <laughs> Oh, hell on a minute, this scares vulnerable. So that's how that kind of... I don't want to push you on any... No, you're fine, you're right. Yeah. ...to talk about what age were you... And I take it, when you try to take your life, what age were you then? 19. Just coming up to 19, yeah. 19, 20, yeah. 19. It wasn't long after losing your wee baby. Yeah, it was about two years, yeah. And then you started in this relationship with a guy that was coming. He's twenty nine. Did you say he was ten years older than you? He was ten years older than me. Yeah. Okay. It's, I'm just because we we've we've sort of we're we're getting an idea, and and I know you've said he's been abusive, and I I, f- I get a feeling that sometimes we're not getting all not all because I, I completely know you've been open with, mm-hmm. but I I'm not liking the sound of this guy just. By the way, that it, it the 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 selfishness attitude towards the disrespect, it when when things turned really bad, when you you decided to go your separate ways, and you seen the solicitor, and you've now got to the point where you're 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 sitting down with your solicitor. It's a such a common thing for isolating debt, financial, mm-hmm. for abuse of controlling people mm-hmm. to isolate. I'm. I'm not saying women because it can be done. Oh, men can go but, through it. Yeah, but it, it it's one area of control because it takes a massive deal of control away, the financial freedom. And and he was always very covert with, wouldn't have joint accounts and you're married with children for God's sake. You mm-hmm. you, you have a house. Mm-hmm. It just when when you realised and he was like and he had two girls to be raised. Mm-hmm. And he's keeping the money for the apartment. And I, and, I, and I have to say this. Whoever gave you that advice. Oh, here. Whatever should have been reported to the bar. Because that, that I, 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 I just don't see how they would. Maybe they couldn't have acted on your behalf. Mm. But they should have pointed you somewhere. And if, yeah. if it wasn't in their jurisdiction, they should have said, you need to speak to somebody in England that will act on your behalf in, mm. in that seal. Like if a woman's come vulnerable, and thankfully there is organisations like Women's Aid that yeah. can help with 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 yeah. and and for anyone watching this oh. that is being financially isolated, mm-hmm. there's help out there. Th- yeah, oh help and, out there, and you're and there is people there that know what they're talking about mm-hmm. and will be fit to help you in this yeah. situation. But then, what did you do then? Did you just say I'm giving up on that or? No. What? He, I contacted the sister to say that about the money, the flat and all. And he was like, and it was to try and arrange contact as well for the gears because he then, he used to come up every week, but all of a sudden he said, right, I'm not coming up to every three weeks. And I was like, oh, how long am I? I'm here with no family. I had two wee toddlers. What age were the girls? Chloe was just over the year coming up to two. Freya was coming up to just over three. So there was two years difference between the two gears. And I was all. I need help. I need support. Like, can your mum take the gears once a week? Collect. collect for it. I didn't drive at the time as well. So the wee village or the wee seaside town that I loved was like all hills. All hills. There was days that somebody, 
there was days people used to say to me, Jesus, we are going to pass yourself in the street. Because you know what? Well, I've walked from one end of the town to the other end of the town three, four, five times a day. Detect the wee one to play grip, detect the wee one to mother and taller grips. I still got up and got out and took the kids out because that was my focus getting up, getting them out, doing things with them. Because I always had that way, I'm having to do nights, so I'm having to check the first one out all the time. So uh, I said, contact, we need to try and sort contact. And he was like, no, not come up there every three weeks now. I'll come up on a Friday and go home on the Monday. And I was so all, here, you used to come up every week. And I knew his schedule too. He has holidays, it was great. He used to get 10, 10 weeks off a year because I, I worked for London Underground. So I knew how his road worked. And um, his mum, he was like, no, nah, I'm not going to have the gears. So again, that's where isolation comes under, controlling isolation. And so I had to go and sign on. I'll never forget. It was, I phoned it. The sister, the one I was speaking to, he was like, um, no, the house is in England and it's like, rich you have to prove son he was getting richer gold or something something to do with gold or golden riches or something it's something to, I had to prove that he got rich because I made him richer son son like that the Scottish law and I was oh, all right okay here we go and so thankfully my daddy was great he was there like I'll pay my ex was covering the mortgage anyway so my daddy's like I'll help with a wee bit of bills or whatever and um so I it was a weekend and I was knack I'll never forget it and it was a Sunday it was a scorch of a day and I was at the beach with the gears and I was tired because I was doing it my own took the gears for the beach for the day and was walking home and I messaged him and I said look I'm booked to go home to Ireland for a week um he used to send me messages to try and manipulate me too to try and get me Andy because he told me he was making a case against me of me being abusive or me things he was turning around at me and I turned around and I messaged him I said look I'm burnt out there's nothing here for me um I'm going home to Ireland and I don't think I'm going to come back well he literally messaged me back and went thank you for letting me know thank you for replying that you're going to be removing the children from North, uh, from Scotland I'll advise Miss Luster <laughs> it was like here what your sister got to do with whether I go to Ireland or not, whether I go back home to Derry, what's that got to do with your sister? So it was on a Wednesday, and I'll never forget it, I had an appointment with the job centre, a place that I thought I would never go one day. I got the eldest looked after, and I had to take the wee one with me in the pram, got the train, got on the job centre, went down to sign on or start making a claim and I broke down I felt I was begging for money I had a hundred pound in my purse that my ex would every time he dropped the kids off he put a hundred pound in the bag and that's it I had foot to pay I still and uh, I remember breaking down crying going I've walked away for a job that I've been for 10 years earning good money and I've resorted to this and the woman that was there she was brilliant brilliant she got me a tissue and said look you're grand you're okay and do you need housing better and I was like look no it's fine he pays the mortgage so I don't need that and all this out in the other and then I came home collected the oldest got on doors and it was all the weather it was raining down pouring down and I remember getting indoors and being soaked and having to strip us off. And I got into my jammies. And the next thing, there was a knock at the door. And I opened the door. And two court sheriffs stand at the door, serving me with an interim interdict to say that I was unable to remove the kids, the children out of Scotland. What a bastard. He doesn't even want to fucking see them. No. Nah. And I literally went. I just, I cried, cried, but in between that, I, I, no, I cried, and 
this and I fought my daddy and I was oh daddy there's men here court sheriff's here and I'm being served my daddy typical Northern Ireland dairy man <laughs> what and my daddy said put me on the phone so he goes here you may take him two gears now and I kind of went whoa he goes because she's not going to cope he goes she's no support and you're serving her he goes, Ian, take him two wins, and I was all, here no, I was kind of like, no, nobody's taking my gear, no, nobody's taking my children, and um, so they left, and I tried phoning Miss Lester, and he was away playing golf. He was off playing golf for the day, knew nothing about it. Didn't know anything this was coming. Didn't even know. I was like, all right. So my dad, I said, right, get yourself a sister outside this time. That's just when the alarm bell started ringing. Get yourself a sister. So I remember phoning a sister, sister in Edinburgh, explaining the situation with them. And the sister turned around and said, you're not entitled to legal aid. I went, well, I said, I am not working and not, you have equity in your house. I was all, no, I'm deaf. Nope. You have equity. I was all... Right, okay. I can't pay for Sulster. So my dad said, right, we'll help you. We'll pay, because I knew I had money coming. So he said, right, we'll help you, we'll pay. Through my through London on the ground. So my dad said, right, we'll help you, we'll pay. For the Sulster's fees. So I was like, right, okay. So I then was like, no, this is not right. I need to find proof that he's having an affair. I need to know where he's loving, who he's loving with. I need this. So I phoned a private private detective. Done my Google search, phoned a private detective, a detective, and told him his situation. I know about our five hundred pound. Put a tracker on his car. You let me know when he's going to be back up in Scotland. We'll put a tracker, or I can put a tracker in London on his car. And I said, well, it's probably better Scotland because I don't know where he lives in London, so I wouldn't know where because he sold the flat then walked away, and he was still using the address. He's still actually using the address. For the sisters, for his flat in London. So I was like, so you may put that tracker on the car in Scotland. So he was like, right, no bother. So I told my dad, and my dad was like, don't touch it. That's ridiculous. What are you on about? Just stick with the sisters. I was like, right, okay, we'll stick with the sisters. So I phoned your man back. I said, look, forget about it. He wanted the 500 pound up in there. So I was like, forget about it. I said, we're going to go down the legal route. Well, I'll fight it. So I started then doing my investigation. I realised that I actually had his passport to be able to his phone records. So got the girls to bed, sat down, got on his phone records, found a number, rang numbers that I didn't recognise. It must have been like a woman on the scene. I swear to God, but people must have thought I was losing the plot, <laughs> phoning, and came across this number, rang a number, and it was a woman that we worked with, her voicemail. And I was all right. Here we go. So the next day I went, do you know what? I'm only going to, the people's going to give me the answers is the people I worked with. They know the crack. They know what's, if they're have, having an affair, then they'll know about it and work. So again, I was like a woman in deranged. I started phoning around all the stations in London Underground that I worked at. And uh, staff were like, here, we can't tell you, which they couldn't tell me none. They were like, we can't tell you. I but he was going down, What he, I didn't realise, apparently he was going down, his best mate, who, one of his good friends, who worked for London Underground, was our grimsman man at the wedding. So I went, Do you know what, I'm going to ring him, I'm going to phone him. So I phoned him and I said, go and tell me, please be honest with me, what's going on between so and so and so and so. And he went, look, Ashley, it's not up to me to tell you the truth. He said, but one thing I'm going to say to you, get yourself a very good slicer. He goes, get yourself a very good slister. He goes, that's all I'm about to say to you. He goes, I can't tell you any more than that. He goes, but... And I find out he, in the April, when the first incident occurred, he was actually going around telling people that we were separated. That we weren't together anymore. That I was way off... Off my head. And he couldn't love me anymore and all this that and the other stories he was saying. And I was all right. Was that how we're going to play it? And 
I, so the Antramante Act, I had a make a court appearance day fight like this. Um, no, I entered that I couldn't, I couldn't even go to Ireland. Then the week after, I wasn't allowed to go, so I lost out and even going home, and got the sisters and sister was like right what do you want and I was like right I have a plan either he comes up every week or if he's going to come up every three weeks his mum sees the girls once a week takes the girls on a Wednesday collects them from playgroup makes them their dinner gives them their tea brings them home in their jammies it means I'm getting that evenings on my own as a break just that one day break just yeah. just to clear my head just for yeah. me no his mama his mama doesn't is this out of spite? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I was all, no. Uh, I said, well, it's not going to work. I said, I'm either, so I'm going to have to move to Ireland. And if I move to Ireland, he can fly home every three, he can fly to Ireland every three weeks and see the girls in Ireland. No difference. No difference. Why is Ireland or that way? No. No. And then... We were getting deeper and deeper and the sisters was like, no. And then I remember my dad line. No, we went to court. And the interim interdict had to stay in place. I couldn't remove the girls out of Scotland. Um, because I thought if I had moved the girls out of Scotland, he'll never see the children again. And I was like, I was devastated. Actually, the day I turned up at court, the sisters that I was paying for actually couldn't come. They hired a local sister to come. And I met her and I told her and you could see her eyes. And then I also told her, by the way, I said he has the dress that he's using is actually a Scottish, is actually our dress in London. I said, but he doesn't live in that house anymore. That's gone. I said, so he shouldn't be using that address. And there was an instant a week or so before that that after I found discovered that number and discovered her, I phoned and finally got through to him. But he wasn't at the station that he should have been at. Apparently he left because he had to go down DC so-and-so because she wasn't feeling well. And I was all, what has she got to do with him? This part that... So I phoned the station that he was at and this fellow answered the phone. He said, hi, is that so-and-so? And I said, no, it's not. This is his wife. And your mom was all, oh, right. Somebody here wants to speak to you. So he came on the phone and I was all, why is he calling me so-and-so? How often? She she obviously must phone you at work. And, and he was all, what's it to do with you? We're not married anymore. None of your business. And cut me off and I was all, I, it's just the proof. I wanted this proof because then I could have the freedom to go, to say, here, he's had this. And so I had a plan that I knew when he arrived to collect the gears that he would come under the house to get our daughter's car seat. And I knew he kept his phone down at the side of the golf compartment, down at the side of the door, sorry. So I was all right. He goes under the house. I'm going to slap out and get his phone. So my oldest daughter starts putting around in the garden, the front garden, and he's going on to get the car seat. I'm on outside, and I open the car door, and I grabs his phone. But he clocks what I do. Done. Well, he runs for me, rubble tackles me to the floor, busts my lap. Trying to get this phone off me. More full me. I didn't bring it on myself. But shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. But desperate measures. <laughs> cause for desperate times as they say. Um, he managed to get the phone off me. But I remember hearing my oldest screaming. Calling for help. And I clocked her from the corner of me. I running. Wee legs running down the road. To get somebody to help. Daddy certain mommy. And he gets the gears into the car and he's in that mood and he speds off. And then I'm terrified because it's them two wee wains in the car and I'm all right. The roads are bad here because it's all wee country roads. 
if he's going at that speed and his car so I phone a friend that lives in England who's a social worker and I phone her and I'm all what do I do she says phone the police phone the police get the police get them involved she goes you need as much help as you can get that's all right so I phone the police and they land and they said right we'll try and get him uh, we'll put a search out for him we'll try and get him and I told him what happened me trying to check his phone they go to the mammy's house he wasn't there and then he finally handed himself on and he turned the tip didn't turn the tables but police landed back at my house that night and said look they're charging me I'm charging you because you stole his phone and I kind of burst into tears and the police man turned around and said look this is not him here this is just him being petty this is him now kind of clutching kind of uh, straws here he goes don't panic it's not him it's not serious it's not not that I've never so I was like right okay so he cautioned me and leave and the next day a lady comes out and takes the pictures of the bruises and it was the first time I've ever actually had to get pictures taken by even when I, my last partner got arrested. I never had, because I wouldn't press charges, so they didn't take pictures. But this was the first time I said, no, I'm going to push this now. I'm going to stand. I have two daughters. And so when I was in court that day, this was, this was the first time I ever stepped in court. I came on and it was like, oh, marble and just so daunting so daunting and I goes on and I meet this new sluster and I tell her what happened and I explained to her about the situation because they were bringing it up in court to you about what happened with the phone and stuff and um so I said look his address because I seen the paperwork the documents and I said that's not his address he's using the dress that he sold in London so they must, I don't know what happened. He was in a different room for me, but the next thing, two police officers landed. So I don't know what went on. She obviously could see I was petrified, like. And they were on with him, questioning him. But I think it was, apparently they were trying to get an address off him. That's why they called the police, because he was refusing to give an address of where he lived. So we actually gave his mum his address in Scotland. So we knew what he was, he knew what he was doing. So we gave his mum his address. And I was still like, but that's when he was all, I can't give my address because he was just. So anyway, then from Manchester, I had to stay. I had to stay in Scotland with the gears. He was coming up every three weeks. That's basically all or nothing. All or nothing. And so it was kind of two and four for nearly a year. I was nearly, I remember my daddy phoning me one night going, Ash, this needs to end. We were nearly £10,000 on slushers, knee deep. And Sasha's face by then. So I phoned. No, that funny. No, it's not. That day I was on with the sister. I actually said to her that I was paying for sister, and she looked at me and she was all, Why are you paying for sister's face? You're entitled to legal aid. I was all, I was told I'm not because I've echoed. And she said, No, you're entitled to legal aid. So I was all right, okay. And she was brilliant. She was brilliant. At the was time, was this the one that was showed up as a representative? Yes, for the other. Okay. Yeah, okay. this was one that's like the local that showed up as a representative. Yeah. So I remember my daddy said, Look, we'll just stick with the ones we're doing at the moment. But I was getting to the point then, it was like my daddy phoned the sisters and my daddy phoned me and he said, These sisters tell, you, tell me you're not being consistent. You don't know what you want. You're one minute you want to go to Ireland, and the next minute you. And I was all in all that I. I am being consistent. I know exactly what I want. Either he, his mum steps up and gives me the help that I need or I'm going back to Ireland. I said, how plain as day is that? And I remember my daddy getting angry with me too. And I was like, oh, I really don't need this. So I said, he, do you know what? I said, here's my password for my emails. You read my emails and then you come back and tell me if I'm being consistent or not. So a couple of hours passed. And the next thing the phone rings and it's my daddy and my mommy. And my daddy's nearly in tears. He's uh, he's all, Ash, I'm sorry. He goes, I've re- read your emails. He goes, they're unbelievable. He goes, you're amazing. He goes, the thing, he goes, you're, everything you're saying is the way they're worded, the way they're, he goes, I'm, I'm 
you're amazing, amazing. He goes, right, what we're going to do, he goes, we'll get rid of them and we'll get the legal aid. Go to your one that represented you in the court. We'll go to her and we'll push now. We'll push. So I was all right. So we then had to start mediation. That's one of the things that you have to do. So it was coming up now into the summertime again. So it was nearly a year on, nearly a year on. And it was coming up to summertime. And we started the mediation. I think we only done about two sessions before I went, do you know what? Sack us. Because it was always has way or no way. There was no, oh, how can I say it? Compromising. There was no compromising with him. He didn't move an inch. So remember going saying, right, you need to be coming up more and more. Either you're coming up more and more or your mum needs to help. I am exhausted. I am burnt out and I need the support. Nah, nah. And so I literally just went, do you know what? I'm going home. I had, do you know what? I had two, three choices. Stay in Scotland, move to England to be closer to where he was. Move to Luton, back to Luton because my parents still love in Luton. So move to Luton where my parents still loved and where he actually loved so he would have had more contact with the gears or go back to Derry. I didn't want to raise the gears in England. It's not, I have friends that's raising their children and oh my God, they're getting on great. They're getting on amazing. But England for me, raising children, I just didn't like it. It's not, my children grew up in a wee seaside resort uh, town in Scotland or Derry's. You know what I mean? It has its issues, but no. it's more beneficial for the daughter, my daughters. Plus, I still have family support. So I went, no, I'm going back to Derry. And I was always the one out of my mum and daddy's, two, out of my brothers, that I was the one that was never going back home. <laughs> I'm never going home. So made the decision, turn them in mediation, said, no, I'm going home. And the mediator was all, well, how's, this going to, how's that going to work? How are you? How is he going to have contact? So I wrote that by then I was desperate, desperate. I just said, right, I'll fly back every three weeks. I'll fly back to Scotland every three weeks with the gears. He can stay in his mommy's and I'll stay in the house that we own until it's sold. And I'll cover the cost of the flight. Bear in mind, I was on benefits and skint. And I will, he can still have holidays and all. Christmas Christmas holidays will still be every other Christmas and so going to court because I then was kind of in contact with Sister in Northern Ireland then and they kind of said look if the girls are here for six weeks we kind of have jurisdiction then so whatever they say in Scotland's out the window I kind of yeah it's all right so I went down to court that day the sisters put it across said right She'll fly back every three weeks. She'll bring the girls on a Friday and fly home on a Sunday. Bear in mind, my wee one was turning five then and she was starting school. So she was going into school. I had a school set up. I knew the school school I went to as a primary school, which I kind of didn't really like, but it was the only way I could get around, get around the door. Like, And so I had a school set up. I had a house set up and everything. So plus I had the family support. Thankfully, they said, right, you can go. But they're still under Scottish jurisdiction. You still have a contact order. You still have, yeah, you've agreed to bring the gears back every three weeks and you've agreed. So I packed up and left and came home. And the first trip we were doing, I thought I left all the furniture, all the big furniture, the beds, everything in the house, the house that we owned. So I was all right, the cooker, everything, microwave, everything. So I was like, right, I can save a bit of money because I'll not need anything. So the gears can go to their daddy, to their ma- has my granny's house. And I'll go to my, the house that we owned. Land it, came to where we loved and he took the gears. I walked down to the house, it was empty. Not a bit of furniture, not even a kettle to boil the water for a cup of tea. Not even a bed. So I had to go down to the shop. No, my dad, I booked. He said, look, Ash, you can stay in a hotel. I said, no, you, you have done enough for me. I'm not letting you 
do any more because this is going to have to be every three weeks now so I'm going to have to try and do something so I went and bought a kettle bought a blow up bed I bought a wee uh, my friend uh, my daughter had like um, you know one of them wee DVD players with a TV screen so I borrowed that from her so I could watch DVDs in bed <laughs> and I stayed in one room I never left the room for three days to have myself away and so that went on for a good couple of months and then in November my wee one took shingles the oldest because she was trained too she was like god love them they went through the mill and I remember not going saying no I was told that Northern Ireland can take over jurisdiction but they couldn't because there was already a contact order in Scotland so they couldn't take over jurisdiction so she ended up with shingles it just shows you how long a process takes too because she ended up with shingles I didn't take her because she was sick so obviously I failed to keep the contact so I was in contempt of court and so that was something that I was going to get the wrath of and so that never really came about nothing really happened to that so then I we were nearly coming on day a year no then at Christmas time I said look I can't do this anymore so I went back to court again in Scotland and said look he has to do the travel now I said he has to fly on the Northern Ireland to collect the gears and take them because I can't afford to keep up with it anymore I'm financially struggling and so they were like thankfully they kind of agreed right okay he can take over now he can fly collect the gears take them and I said, look, there's nothing stopping him from staying in Northern Ireland. I, I even offered to move out of my own home. I said, I'll move out of my house for him to stay in my home. Just so them two wee girls could see their daddy. That's all I wanted was them to see their daddy. They have contact. They see them. And he was like, no, nah, I'm taking them back to Scotland. So again, done all that to and fro and for nearly coming up to a year. And I remember it was the December and I was in Northern Ireland then just... And I was trying to get then Northern Ireland to take over full jurisdiction, like the whole contact order. And it was Christmas time. And he had the gears for New Year because we always done Christmas turnabout and it was every other Christmas. So he phoned. No, my sister phoned me because I was in contempt of court then too. There's on oh in the November again too, he um would tell me it'd be at a different airport, but it wouldn't be at that airport, it'd be at the other airport. Or he wouldn't be there, and so, but he would blame it me, saying, "Oh, I try to tell her that I was going to be there. I've had to get that flight back now because I've missed the flight, and so he didn't get the gear, so it was my fault." But he was manipulating again, saying, "Oh, I told her that it was so the other airport, not Belfast International." <laughs> so it was like, "Oh, wacky racers sometimes going, trying to run the up and with the gears." So he then, I was in contempt of court again and his sister fought me and it was Chris, It was just coming up to Christmas and the girls were due to go to him for a year and I having a conversation with her on the phone and she let slips on about your contact order ends on the 4th of January and I was all, what do you mean my contact order? And she said, oh you have to go back to court again to get a new contact order and all set up. I was all, sure nobody told me. I said, you're only telling me this now. I said, why are you only telling me this now? But she realised what she said and she went quiet. Alarm bells again started ringing with me. Hang on a minute, he's going to have them gears in Scotland. On the 4th of January, I'm not going to get these gears back. He's going to keep these gears in Scotland. And then I'm going to be fighting a custody battle. So I started going, what am I going to do? Um, I phoned my cousin ex-partner had a brian slicer and he said phone phone the slicer that so-and-so used fantastic one of the best family sisters that you'll ever get so i phoned her spoke to her she said oh you can get a residence order so it means that the children still reside with you but they can go to scotland they scotland can have the contact but we can get a residence order here meaning that the children reside with you and all the year that i was there not one sister turned around to tell me i could have got a residence order it was all, we're not touching that, because that's Scotland. We're not touching it. We're not touching it. Nothing to do with us. So, went to court. 
got the residence order pushed through pretty quickly. And my sister in Scotland wasn't impressed. So I was due to attend court on the 7th of January to get a new contact order. But I didn't want a contact order. I wanted Northern Ireland to take jurisdiction then. I was all right. I'm done. Northern Ireland takes jurisdiction. I'm finished here. And But I was still in contempt of court too. So on the 7th of January, I went to court. And I could find contempt of court. They wouldn't discuss the... Um, the Northern Ireland Technical Jurisdiction, they wouldn't discuss it. Um, but I ended up in contempt of court anyway, and they wanted to find me £250. And I said, right, I'll pay it now. Oh, no, 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 she pay, pay it off £10 a month. You're all right, just pay it off 10 And I said, no, I'll pay it now. No, you're all right, pay it 10 I was like, no, pay it now. So my mommy helped me over there. She paid, got it sorted. So um, they wanted me then to agree to a contact order right he said can you agree to I said no I'm not agreeing to anything I'm not agreeing to nothing what I said I'm not agreeing so they adjourned to court and they said right we're adjourning you'll come back I think it was a week later or something so I left and he knew he was losing then oh he knew that I wasn't following my instincts anymore because I could agree to a contact order and say alright we'll agree to that so I left paid the fine left went home and there was just someone niggling at me like he was really getting starting to really starting to get dirty now and the next day I took my wee ones Irish dancing and my youngest was playing up he there was, he had a phone in the garage every night at six o'clock too every night at six o'clock he had a phone in the garage and he used to manipulate that phone call every night at six o'clock had a phone in the garage so the wee one was playing up in Irish dancing being naughty, not doing what she was told and just being one of them. And I said, right, that's it. You're not getting hot chocolate when you get, because they always got hot chocolate before they went to bed. I was all right, you're not getting hot chocolate. So get some home. My wee one's kicking hell for Lailer, screaming. And I was all, if your daddy hears this, he'd be thinking I'm bitten the day that's out of you. And I was all, Chloe, Freya was, um, Tommy was explaining to your daddy, oh, mommy wouldn't give Chloe hot chocolate because she was being naughty at Irish dancing and, the club it was really going on one. So I finally got them settled, got them under bed, and I, there was just sun. And I got under my bed. The next thing it was just near just before nine o'clock at night, I was lying in bed reading my book. I knew my heart sunk. I knew he was at the door. Goes up, looks at the land of London, two on Mark car sitting outside. Goes down the stairs, open the door. Two police officers stand at the door. I looks at them and I was all here. Before we go any further, see what you've been told. It's not. He's been up letting. And the female police officer went here. We're only here. He actually didn't call us. He called the NSPCC. They've sent us out. Can we come on? Yeah, no bother. Comes on. Come into the living room. The male police officer fire played him. He turns around. The first thing he says to me is, "Is he controlling?" And I literally just burst into tears. And I went, "Yeah." I said, "Look, we're in the process of Northern Ireland trying to get jurisdiction." I said, "From the Scottish courts," and he turned around. And he was all, "Right." And the female police officer was all, "Look, we're going to have to. Go, I'm going to have to go." On. And again, I burst into because I knew what because I was wanted to be a soldier and I knew what was coming. And I burst on the tears again and I was all, look, I'm not crying because I have anything to hide. I have nothing to hide. I'm crying at the indignity that you are now going to have to go up to my daughter's bedrooms and you're going to have to f- physically examine my babies and their sleep. I said, I broke down in tears and she was like, look, you're fine. You're all right. So she goes up the stairs and the wee ones are in the room and she turns the light on. And she goes over and she lifts the blankets down and she goes on very close just to smell if there's any intoxication from them. And the wee legs, cuffs, she kind of just lifts them up a wee bit. And they're both flat out, not a twitch. And she comes back out of the room and we're going down the stairs and the male police officer opens the living room door and she looks at him and she goes, oh, two wee critters up downstairs. Not a people and not a flinch when I turned that light on. They're in the most beautiful room, 
so cozy. She goes, oh, beautiful. So content. And I just burst into tears. Because I always was doubting myself as a mother, everything that I was going through. Because, God, I lost my tip. You know what I mean? That, geez, I would crack up with him. Or, but he used to manipulate He used to manipulate them. This is when the parent alienation comes into it. When they go and stayed with him. And they used to come back. My eldest used to be, I hate you, mommy. You're angry, mommy. Daddy says you're angry all the time. So the things that he used to say, to it, you can't get angry at me. So I was walking on age hills into the fear that, sweet Lord, what's he come back and saying to her? Or what's he? And again, to when the female police officer said, look, we're, we're going to have to. And I said, look, I know you're going to have to contact social services. And I know social services is going to have to come out. And again, I started crying. I said, again, this is nothing. I said, I don't want my daughter to cut up in this. And now they're going to be cut up in it. Because now social services. So the next day, social services arrived. Lovely lady. Lovely, lovely lady. She comes in. And she's all, pardon me. She's all about, about me. Who's looking after you? What break are you getting? You getting help? You getting support? The Wayans were great. She said, bring it, mommy. Not an issue, no problems. So we're closing the case. There's nothing here for us. And again, I explained because I'm trying to get jurisdiction. So I was due then the second court case, the last court case, and it was a week later. And goes to court. I was still working with my sister Norna, and she was brilliant. Goes to court, and my sister. The Scottish officer was trying to get me to agree to a contact order. She was all right, can you agree to this? I was like, no, no. She was like coercing me into something to agree to before I went down to the courtroom. I was like, no. She was like, but he's saying I'll not see the girls again. I was like, well, that's his decision. If he decides to walk away, that's his choice. I'm never going to stop him from seeing the girls. I'm not that type of mother. He has a right to see the girls. Oh, go on, please agree. I was like, no, no. So I was adamant I wasn't agreeing to it. Even my daddy was with me, I think. And he was clutching, because my daddy had a couple of heart attacks. And between all that, and my daddy was clutching his chest, going, please, go and agree. Go play. And I was like, no, no. And he was like, go and please agree. And I was like, no, I could see my daddy. And I was like, no, I'm not agreeing to anything. They're trying to coerce me into something degree, and I'm not agreeing to it. So he goes under the courtroom, and the court sheriff comes on, and he's uh, looking at me, and he's London there, and it up. London Dairy and a down and I like Dairy, London Dairy, Timbok too. I don't not that type of person. And he was all she's paid the contempt of court. She's and has sister tried to bring up what the incident that happened with the police and all and he said, Look, I don't that's been resolved, that situation. So she services closed the kiss. No problems, no issues. Kiss is closed. So they lay, left. No, he said, look, I have to make a decision now. I'm going to adjourn and go away and think and then come back and make my decision. So he adjourns and we leave the room. And in about an hour or so later, he comes back and he's all right, I've made the decision. There's no ties here for you. You're best in London. There's no ties. There's no court orders in place. She's paid or fine. There's nothing tying used to the courts anymore there's no unfortunately I'm going to have to hand jurisdiction to Northern Ireland well I this is why they didn't want you to pay the penalty in full yeah because it's not span Mm -mm. I leave that courtroom and the relief the unbelievable relief and I said, look, if he wants jurisdiction, uh, sorry, if he wants contact, he goes through my sister in Northern Ireland. And I leaves and I get on and I phone my sister in Northern Ireland and I said, we got jurisdiction. She literally went, what? That's, she went, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, how did you? she goes, can you come on and see me tomorrow? I was like, yeah, no problem. She goes, I need to speak to you. I was all right. She goes, I need to know how, I need to know how you got jurisdiction. I said, all right, okay. So I left. Go on and see her, got the carriage to school. Goes up and sees her, comes under the room, and she literally said, close the door. So I closed the door, and she went, how did you get jurisdiction? 
And I was all, all at my aunt's tanks. She was all, what do you mean? I said, they try to coerce me and agreeing to stuff that I don't want to agree to. And I wasn't agreeing to. I was over there for one bit. And she said, look, I have something to tell you. She goes, I know what you had to endure last week with the police and the social workers and this. She goes, but it, I don't want to tell you what I had to fight, fight behind closed doors. She goes, you have no idea the battle I was fighting behind closed doors. She went to Scotland. Scotland was adamant. They weren't handing her instruction over. She goes, they were adamant. And I was all, what do you mean? She goes, I didn't want to tell me that you weren't getting jurisdiction. She goes, I couldn't tell you. And she goes, can I have someone else to tell you? She said, you're one of my hardest kisses that I have to deal with, but yet you're my easiest client. And then it moved, then the court cases moved to, up to Bishop's Gate, courthouse, the lower one. Oh, then the court cases went up there and I probably became a familiar fist up there. <laughs> um, he must have went through that many sisters in the time. I still stuck with the same sister. I never left. And with social, like I, when they used to call our name for the cases, you used to see all the sisters getting up and coming into the viewing room to listen to the case. Because they were just mesmerised by everything that we were going through the pet I was the only mother that must have been up in that court fighting for a partner fighting for her ex-husband to actually have more contact with his children than fighting against him having contact because I wanted him to have contact I wanted him to come down and I wanted him to see the children I wanted him to not need him to get on a plane and fly over him cheap hotels nothing but no it was all his way no way the three week contact stopped it was every holidays and he would have summer holidays, every other Christmas, New Year, Christmas or whatever. But the Northern Ireland courts did kind of muck up a wee bit. He had them for Christmas and we discovered then, it was coming up to Christmas in, and we discovered that he actually, it was on the court order that he had them every Christmas. And that came to, <laughs> came to a light nearly a year later. And I was all to my sister, no. I said, we agreed every other Christmas, that was always the contact. So she was like, oh God, we need to go back to court then and get this rectified so he must have been told because he never attended any of the court hearings in Northern Ireland he wouldn't but he must have been told at the time you need to come to this hearing because if you don't come you're not going to be getting anything that you want so it was the first time he ever rocked up and he I remember going into a wee room to try and negotiate first where we we had child child officer family protection no like one of them child officers and I remember the three of us, it was literally, it was smaller than this room, smaller than this room, me and him sitting side by side and her sitting business to try and come to some kind of compromise. And he was not for budget, not having him at Christmas. And me and her, it, I could see her neck and redder and redder and she's looking at me and I'm looking at her going, this is the type that I've been having to deal with for <laughs> nearly two and three years on. And, um, and I turned around and I said, you know what? I broke down. And I had to leave the room and they come back and I actually sat down and I said, you know what, I can have him for Christmas again. The second year, I can have him for Christmas. Christmas to me can be any time. We, we tried him a Christmas special. We done the elves come and stuff. So I was all, do you know what, I can have him again. Then I'm having him for Christmas this year again. That's, she was all, you sure? I said, I, do you know what? So he goes back into the courtroom and she goes up on the stand and she says what we've agreed and the judge goes, right, I'm going to go on and decide. And he goes on and he comes back out again and he sits down and he goes, before we go any further here, he goes, I have to command this mother. He goes, in all the years that I have been sitting here, he goes, I have never, ever seen a mother that's always had her children's best interest at heart and always had it above her own. He goes, she doesn't have to be as compliant as what she's mean. He goes, it's an actual privilege for me to witness this. He goes, it's, and it was the first time I've ever received that you're doing whatever thing you fought for and what you fought and what you've done. You're, you're not being selfish. You're not doing it for your own. You're doing it for them. And then he was like, and I could say, I, he asked my partner how much he earned. And my partner told him, and I remember my sister looking at me going, 
and you're getting none. And uh, a, da- a dad kind of, and uh, I literally just cried. And the judge even turned and said, I don't have to give you these children for Christmas. He goes, I don't have to. He goes, but I'm going to. He said, you can have them for Christmas. He said, but we're going back to every other Christmas. So that was it. And then it was coming up then to my eldest first communion time. She was eight years of age, wanting to make her first communion. He's non-religious, very, um, how do I put it, big massive Rangers fan. Um, he used that against me quite a lot. And he was like, I happened to go on and say to my sister, look, my eldest wants to make her first communion. And she was all right. But I did do deceitfully. We agreed when we got married, the children weren't going to be christened. We made that decision. They weren't going to be christened. And when I moved back home to Northern Ireland, I did go and get them christened without telling them, which I did do deceitfully. It was wrong. But it was what I wanted. It was for me. And I got them christened. So obviously then when it came to the time, because I knew that she, would, my daughters would want to make her first communion because all the ones in their class would be making their first. The only thing was they weren't allowed to go to like a Catholic school. They had to go to, that, that was part of the court order. They had to stay in an integrated school. They couldn't go to any Catholic schools. So I knew that she would want to make her first communion. And I happened to say it. And she goes, you do realize you have to go back to court. I went, well, I said, I have to go to court and get the court's permission. To let my daughters make their first communion? She went, yeah. It's <sighs> all right. So back we tripped to court again. And it was the lower court this time. And Freya then, this is the first time they had to go and actually speak to child officers, children officer, officers and get their, thankfully there was loads of support out there for them. Like Freya needed a lot of support because her daddy was very um, controlling her because he couldn't get to me anymore. He was getting to her and she was only still young. She was only eight by then. And he was always putting her down and saying she wasn't good enough for. So anyway, that she wasn't making her first coming in and all this. So I didn't care if she didn't want to make it. She didn't want to make it. That's her choice. That's not my decision to make. So it wasn't even me that was pushing for it. It was what she wanted so we went to court thankfully she was allowed to make it uh, but he decided he was going to appeal it so I had to go to the higher court so I had to get a barrister then so the day came for us to go to the high court for her to make it and I remember standing on the on the dock and I remember the judge question uh question me and I remember turning around and saying to her your honor this is not hun- this is not me this- wants to her to make her, this is her choice and I said she can do she can believe in whatever she wants but as long as she's not going to cause any dental mental damage or harm to anybody else or force her beliefs on anybody else that's her choice I said I come from an open-minded background I said I've always my parents have kept protected us from a lot of things and uh she was like I said the best person for you to speak to is her herself is my daughter and she kind of went well, what do you mean? I said, well, for you to get a perspective of what she wants, you're actually the best person to speak to her and make your own decision from there. And she was such a like, I said, because I could be standing here and telling you anything, telling you wait, anything to try and make you to decide for her. I said, she was like, well, where is she? Is she at school? I was like, yeah, but she's at school. She was like, well, are you able to bring her out of school? Can you get somebody to bring her up? I was like, yep, yeah, that's not a problem. I'll bring her up, no bother. Phoned a friend, arranged the ju- the court, phoned the school to say that can they release her f- from the thing. So the court contacted the school to say that somebody was going to come up and collect her. My friend went and got her, brought her up. The barristers came out to me to say, do you realise you're still in contempt of court? You're not allowed to disclose anything to her. And the stuff that he used to say to her, he told her that if she made her first communion, and daddy will never see her again. Daddy will never contact her again. She, and daddy will never speak to her again. Daddy will never speak to your granny again which is his mum, because his mum obviously then thinks she started giving him a hard time too. And 
so the wee critter arrived and she looked at me and she was all standing here and I was like yeah she was all I don't want to go on I was like you're fine you're okay please like, so we goes on and we goes over and sits down and I go and get her wee chocolate bar and we're sitting and sitting and I happened to glance over and find out the police officer that was actually at my house was actually sitting two chairs down which I find quite weird and so she's sitting cuddling under me and then the two barristers has barrister my barrister both come out together and they walk towards us and they talk to the wee one and they were all right do you want to come with us now so she comes off goes off and the next thing she comes running out literally comes out of the doors flying out and I'm looking and she's run straight past her daddy run straight over to me and hugs under me and that I could see the two barristers walking towards me and she's oh the judge is not ready for her but I kind of thought right were you testing the waters here were you seeing who she's going to go to did you just bring her in and then say gone out to, to see who she would be afraid of like, because if she, she would have went to daddy or would have went to mommy. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, maybe it was just my paranoia and then kind of thinking things in things. So the next time they came to say, look, that she has ready now to take her. So off they go. The next thing that bars to come back out to say, no, the next time we get called and I'm looking, go, going, where's my wing? I don't know where she disappeared. Eh? Apparently a clerk, court clerk, took her off the shore around the, the court and took her down under where the jail <laughs> where. So she's off having a tour of the courthouse and I goes on to the, we go on, we get called on and we go on and the judge comes out and she sits down and she says, how amazing Freya, uh, how amazing she is and a very bright girl and knows exactly what she wants and she was able to draw pictures and all. And she said that she was telling her that daddy said that he'll never speak to her again or speak to granny again if she made her first communion and also the daddy one time pulled up outside a church and I knew none of this also pulled up outside a church and taught her to get out of the car if that's what she wants go on you on there and apparently he sped off and left her she was only a tit well I just wanted the room D. oh how a father can do that to their child is and she never told me that never told me that that daddy taught her to get out of the car and he left her standing at a church and I was all so I did the judge did turn around and tell me that I did put my children under that situation by getting them christened and by you know what I mean I got a slap on the hand there too. I'm not going to say I was a saint. And she said that she needed time to think and make a decision. So we left. And I was to go back a couple of, day, a couple of days. And this was like a week before she was due to make her first commune. Not even. It was the Thursday she was making her first commune on the Sunday. So we still didn't know whether she was making it or not. He never turned up for the decision. I came up that day and the judge did decide she can't go ahead and make it all oh, the relief I went straight down to that school and I told her she was making her first communion and then contact was still going he was still having seen the gears they're still going over way home to England or London or Scotland or wherever he decided to take him and then he then in Chloe's turn two years later <coughs> She was making her first communion, the same thing again, back to court again. And I actually think this was the last time I ever stepped foot in court. Thank God, last time I put my foot in the courthouse and went down to court and got rolled straight away. I make her first communion. And he never even thought it. He said, I'm not even appealing it. He made the decision not to appeal it, thankfully. And that was the last time we stepped in court. And that was the last time, 2018 was the last time he. A contact with his children mm -hmm. at all. Seen them all. Well, he wouldn't. He started flying to America. Right, this is whole different shenanigan. He, we were afraid to try contacting him, and 
she turned around and she said he answered the phone but it was he was this was in the evening no the six o'clock called and it was pitch black and where he was it was pure bright Fred was like oh where are you where are you oh no nah, nowhere nowhere the next thing there was a knock at the door and it was clean American accents there was always somebody with it. There, he always had a link with America. There was something through that game he played EverQuest. There was always something there. There was always somebody there. I'm over visiting friends from EverQuest or whatever things. And I was all, is a girl on the go here? There's somebody. And so that's where his money was all going in while we're in flying the, an hour on a plane over to here to see his children. He would fly to America twice, three times a year. Um, so New Year's Day 2020 I was in England for Christmas with my parents went to London and I took the girls to London for the day down to Winter Wonderland that's when the Covid was kind of coming through then and I remember contacting would say and bear in mind they didn't see him since 2018 and I remember messaging him I always reached out to him every time I was in London Luton, I would message him and say look I'm here with the girls I'm staying with my mum and dad do you want to see the girls no nah. No, so I reached out to him and I said I'm in London do you want to take the girls for a couple hours take them for dinner take them for Sunday eat this that and the other and he was like right okay I'm working so when I finish work I'll get the girls and we'll meet at Victoria so I was like right so he met the girls at Victoria took them off to London I spent then the evening with my mum in London and Freya and Chloe came back and they were all daddy's phone kept there was a Gare message and daddy, so and so, and he was sending pictures and all. I think daddy has a girlfriend, and I was all oh, crutter. Your daddy's been seeing this person for I don't know, God knows how long. And the next thing, and obviously, COVID hit, and and then he just he's very good at giving them money. He does give them money when Freya calls him the bank of daddy now, that's all he's capable of but I would rather his presence than giving him money because it's teaching them too that they can be bought and it's teaching them values that I don't want them having and there's times I've been sending him a message going go on, please stop te- giving the heirs money because it's not they're, they're not doing what they're told or do you know what I mean yeah. and do, do you know what for what they've gone them two wee girls have gone through touch wood they're well adjusted gears. Oh, I can't. I just hope it doesn't. There's not going. The effect's not going to hit them with a bang at some point. But I, all of this, and that's the one thing. At the at the, in the center of this, there's two beautiful wee girls. Oh, that's. And I am sh- struggling to even that guy's boiling my blood for it. There's a simple thing in this. There's one thing not to want your child to do something if it's in your religious beliefs. But if you're willing to put them in a courthouse, you're willing to do that. It's more he's doing, and it's clear to me, it's a controlling spike. Oh, yeah, yeah, massive it, control. It wasn't anything to do with the right thing for the girls. To trail them through this and to put them through this, and oh. I mean this, any fucking grown man that plays a game video oh. and changes the times that he's with his children to do this needs fucking beat because mm. that is not a man. No. And to pull you through that, to put them through it, I worry, what is it teaching them? Yeah. It's my youngest, my heartbreak goes out to her. Freya's, she's so special. She's like her mama. She reminds me of me. And that's, the Chloe is so introverted she kind of keeps a lot to herself but she's very smart oh that we girl would run wings uh very academic and i remember when she was a tit we went to america with my mommy and my daddy my brother when we were going through all this and it was a year i was living in Northern Derry then a year and we went to america took my mommy my daddy my brother his wife their kids and i remember she was tit and every time she see my brother we has, I could see the two of them, Freya, and watching away at my brother. 
And it used to break my heart because I knew what they were thinking, that they wanted a daddy. And I remember her wee hand. I was hugging her, getting on the plane. And I remember her wee hand going, Mommy, I want a daddy. And I was all, but you have a daddy. I bet I want a mommy and daddy like, Kate and I, like my niece's nephew's mommy and daddy. And I was all, but baby, you do have... And I see her even now with my friends, husbands and stuff. She would sit and put you no know, games with them. And, and that worries me. Um, because I don't know that daddy issue kind of things. You don't want history repeating itself. Yeah, 100%. 100%. That's why it's important for men to set good examples for their daughter. Oh, and that's... See, when I see men that do have daughters and they're sitting bad and I'm all looking, going, see, how do you feel that your daughter comes knocking at your one door one day and say, Daddy, so-and-so, or this is what I've, like, happened, or... My, my daddy has an amazing relationship with my girls. Oh, he would. And that's, I'm glad they have that. Like, Freya would be so close to my daddy. And and I'm glad, and I'm lucky too, because some aspects, they're girls because boys need their daddies too. Oh, boys, you know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. You just need to, need to sit down and think that you're not hurting. You're hurting your own children. It's your children you're hurting. You're not hurting. And but you're hurting your children. It's your children that's suffering. It's your children that's going to end up having the issues or the the impact of what you are are putting them through. Or but your ex husband sounds like the whole way through all that. There he wasn't thinking about anybody on himself. Oh himself. Oh hundred percent. His his goal was to hurt you as much oh, as you yeah. could. And oh. if the kids were getting hurt in the process, oh he that didn't, didn't care. No, it doesn't care. He he's actually married now. He um two years coming up to two years in September. So it was it just coming out a lot. Freya was um so th- she started first year when we had to be COVID in 2020. So she was going on the third year when she officially started going back to school officially. And it was a couple of weeks before, it was in the August, and he messaged. Bear in mind, they had no contact with him. The last time they seen him was New Year's Day of 2020. And he wouldn't even fist He doesn't even pick up the phone and say, hey, girls, what's a, how are you? He wouldn't even fist time them. He wouldn't even. It's messages, text messages. And it's even some nasty messages he was sending. And he sent a message saying, I've saw the teddy of a girlfriend. And I'm thinking about getting married. And her name, so-and-so, which was the same name that it's always been lingering around. And but this person's American. And obviously linked through the game that he played. And... I remember Freya coming down the stairs and it was all, oh, Daddy's getting married and all and this, that and the other. And, and then she was saying that Daddy's going to America. And I knew, it was all, oh, he's not just getting engaged, he's getting married here. So they had it at the time with the COVID, I think they had the time they had to go to Mexico first, to Iceland in Mexico and then go on and then to Florida. So it was September then. And a message to say he sent him a picture of him and her and a car with a marriage license we didn't have his children as well well I don't apparently know I was blamed for, apparently I was being blamed for that apparently because I I was at Fabica apparently it was because I wouldn't let, I want to shake that woman's hand and say here good luck to you good luck to you as long as you're good to my gears you can do you're more than welcome to be a part of their life I just wish you the best of luck but whatever he obviously said to her or you don't know what he's betrayed me as or that I've probably stopped full contact or whatever look there's no doubt in in the middle of that it got so angsty there was so much tit for, and I'm not saying tip for tap actually not tip for tap because uh, it was um, but there's, there's obviously, and you, you've said it yourself, there's things that you, you've done that maybe you weren't. And yeah. Tell, I don't think anyone would blame me. I think anyone would get out. You were isolated. You're on your own. You're doing your best. But the one thing that always, always, always to me was you ha- you, you were carrying the load. Oh, yeah. You were carrying. And you know what? I, I, I laugh at boys like this. 
they'd be fighting you through court. They don't want full custody. No, they... He wouldn't have known what to do with them girls. And God forbid, Jesus, imagine they end up with. If he's willing to use them in such a way, if mm. he's willing to manipulate their mum in such a way, if he's going to make lies to the police that he's been attacked, things like that, he, guys like that want mm. the control over you. And the last way of doing it is through the children. Oh, the co- yeah. And at what cost is relationship with them? It, like... Sometimes I see people going their separate ways, and sometimes marriages just don't work out. Yeah. And and the the next conversation has to be, well, how do we co-parent? Yeah. How do we how do we get through this? How do we navigate that? But this guy just wanted to cause hurt, and oh, and, yeah. and and at any cost, and the girls, and and you can see that, and in the all court cases, and fighting that through that, and the multiple times you've been let down. Mm. It's. It was more to do with political too. It was very political. Um, I would say. So in the let's background. let's go black and white. He he was yeah. Protestant, you were Catholic, very much so. Uh, and then when you went your separate way, you wanted to bring them up in the Catholic faith. Yeah. And he he wanted to dig in. I didn't really want them. It's their their choice. It was their choice. They, I couldn't really care whether they came up raised in the Catholic. It didn't bother me. She being in school and all the wee girls talking about their dresses, and she was actually very religious. At the time, my wee one, she but, was actually, I don't even go to church. I don't even practice. And you chose to christen them. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was from my own personal because of what I'd gone through and endured. With and I'm not questioning because yeah. honestly, I, I completely understand. And, and oh, I, I'm not that saying that deceitfully. as I understand. What I did, I, I hold my hands up. That was deceitful. What but, I did. And that, that I, was, I don't think any of us would judge for that. No. But I just, I'm glad you got, um, tell me this here then. When did you get? To finalise the divorce and the separation. L- literally only around about 2019. So it was literally just before. He obviously must have been arranging to marry this this girl. Because uh, 2019, we got div- he pushed the divorce and I literally walked away. None. Oh, from, from any of the properties? I had 20 increased. grand. If that, that's it. I didn't want nothing. Because I knew he was going to... Didn't even want his pension. And just, do you know what? I just wanted to let it all go. Let it all. Actually, to be fair, I wanted the money, the equity from the money to actually go into a trust for the girls. The whole lot. The whole, all of the money. Because at the end of the day, the way I looked at it, we were building a livelihood and building a future for our children. That home was our financial future for our children. That money belonged to them. That money didn't belong to me or him. And this is where I think that there should be some kind of he was like even saying no he wouldn't even let the money go into a trust for the girls well this this boy seems to be quite driven by the, the money and oh and he's re- very yeah it, and he had a good job mm. he's had assets mm-hmm. he obviously had his comfortable life it to me was the last stand and the last control measure yeah. was to, to, to push you in that but it's the and I'm I'm worried here too, Sean, as we're talking about this. If people are being isolated like that, mm-hmm. you yeah. were you were wrong. Yeah, there is legal aid. Yeah, there is legal aid. No, regardless of what they said, I don't have that in Scotland. Said I wasn't entitled to legal aid because I had equity in the house. Oh no, that I was told wrong. They see money. That's all they see. But also, don't be afraid to seek second opinion Citizens on legal advice, advice yes. or, or another solicitor yeah. and speak to somebody because you you were wrong at a few steps if there. you don't feel comfortable with the advice that you're given go somewhere else the, if there's something ringing with you going that doesn't sound that's not fair I've done so much research online but it oh. just feels like so, so much of that angst and it's so slow the system turning oh it was you this has been going on for years that went on for years you could have met that better solicitor at this yeah. point and you could have you could maybe have cut out so much of this mm-hmm. but just for people that 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 are in a similar position or something like that yeah seek a second opinion yeah it's it's you know th- they're providing a service yeah and and it's not always a good service and they're not always good and uh, they're not always you, you just assume that a solicitor's going to be knowledgeable yeah. Yeah. and that the court's going to be fair yeah. and that everything's going to be done right. And you just assume that that's the way it is. Uh, I can't complain. Northern Ireland, when I got to jurisdiction, they've been, they were amazing. They were amazing. And I think 
it will a lot as I said a lot of it behind as my sister behind closed doors she didn't know it, and I think a lot of it bought on it was political because of the two the mm. <laughs> south of Scotland and Northern Ireland kind of power battle here kind of thing I think that was a lot and you're caught in the middle of it and I'm caught me my children and well he I would say he probably had a substantial amount of pocket as well that well Max has Progress. That was his. What 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 was his? Ge- what what did he say when they wanted to to mediate? What did he say it was that he wanted? He wanted the children to be raised in Scotland. So he wanted you to stay in Scotland, and him come up every three weeks. He actually, this is going to sound. He was at controlling. I remember being back up, getting living back in Northern Ireland, and, and I remember him messaging me one night saying, "Do you know what I really wanted you to do?" Was to commit suicide and for me to walk away with all your money from London Underground. Your death and service money. And I got the wains. All cost it in the years. He said that to me one night in a text message. That he was pushing for me. Well, one thing I would say to anyone. I would save every text message. And I stupidly didn't. Because I didn't realise at the time then. They were fair play. They're fighting now to bring stuff like that to yeah. it court. Paints, it yeah. paints a very clear picture of people. Yeah. Because it's easy if somebody's got a, a good job mm-hmm. and a good legal team mm-hmm. to pin themselves as a very great person. He's very pepper smart. But if He's you, very pepper smart. If you expose a message where somebody ever come out with that, mm. it gives you a very quick insight to exactly the sort of person you're dealing mm-hmm. with. I just, I feel like the courts, you know, can they not sometimes just take it in? What they're actually ruling over, like the fact, yes. the power that they're swaying there, mm. the religious, the, the, whatever your children do is making you stay in a country mm-hmm. where your mentality is at, at, at risk. The the do they not just look at the children and say, Jesus, they're well cared for, mm. they're happy. It's this person should have the say. When that first interim interdict was introduced to me, I thought, hang on a minute, this it was probably a rush job, but. They should have sat down and thought, hang on a minute, right, he's in London loving. She's in Scotland, but that's not where she's from. What support has she got here before we put this court order on, this gear? And what? Because an Andrew Antidic is actually for, I'll tell you what it actually is. It was a uh, song uh, that was made in the olden days when... And a, a man used to, no one on a Friday, they used to get their wages and go to the pub and get drunk and come home in and out of the wife or the wains or whatever. That's what an interim interdict is. And the stuff that was on that paperwork, it pinned at me as an abusive mother. And I'm looking going, right, so he wants me to stay in. He's portraying me as being abusive with two children. But he doesn't want me moving out of Scotland. And he lives in London. And the court sheriff is not looking at this paperwork going, I can't get my head around this. There's more to this. There's more. It's plain black and white to me. I, it's controlling. Reading that, that is controlling behaviour. Rather than like, contacting my sister, who was out playing golf with the day, then that happened. Rather than saying, do you know what? Go on, go to mediation before I put any court order on these children for them not to move. I just because he wasn't going to, is he going to come out and live in Scotland and look after it? No, because his life was in London. It's actually, it's unreal. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to get your head around that. I just, I'm obviously not the same. You're not the same. I bet anybody looking from the outside in on that, no matter who you are, solicitor, barrister, whatever it may be, mm. you wouldn't be looking at it like that. Oh, because that. I sent one text message yes. to say, because I stupidly messaged him to say that I'm going home to Ireland next week and I don't think I'm coming back because I don't have the support here and I need the support to raise our daughters. Yeah. It Also, just, and this is absolutely not relevant to you, but sometimes in the situation where men really are having their children. Some may be on the, the flip side of what you are. Some are maybe on the manipulated, being mm-hmm. manipulated by the mother and to hold the child from them. 
Sometimes that order is yeah. is oh, completely mums necessary. here. Women are no saints too. But we're, I'm oh. not going. I'm not going to bring that yeah, into yeah, this yeah. case because it's not, Aye. and I and I don't feel in my heart from having the conversation Aye. with me that it is. But just some people may be listening to that and saying, "Well, I needed that to keep my children." Yes. But this obviously we completely know that. I just don't understand this, and I know some people have to work ways. Obviously, got a well-paid job, so to travel up every weekend it would be nothing. I just don't understand it because after a couple of days of not seeing your babies, mm-hmm. a day would be like, oh well, that's a hundred percent. I'm having a wee yeah. bit of break. Mm-hmm. Two days, I'd be like, I was away at the rugby for three days. Yeah, <laughs> see, by the time I got home. I was like, I'm away. My my own goes. I'll go down and lift him. I goes, no, I'm going to go and lift. Is that with the sore head? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it it and I'm not saying that all oh, Jesus. But I'm just saying, I don't know. He's not to me. That's not a real man. Yeah. First and foremost, the arrangement he had with you to travel up and 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 babies on your own is just ridiculous. Secondly, working nights when there's a newborn in the house mm-hmm. as an option because you want to play a you, Oh my God, that needs beat. I just the video game thing it's not for me I <laughs> yeah. I'm never yeah. bored <laughs> but I I want to finish up and say absolutely unreal what you're doing for the videos and it's how hard you've fought yeah. for them and by all sounds how well they've turned out touch wood keep going the way they're going and hopefully you've set the standard for them for what to accept in their life to not accept that sort uh, of man to not lower yourself mm-hmm. to know what you're worth and do not Yeah, I've not my girls have never seen me with a man since well, because I, well, I hope you find somebody that you, that, that and this time, this my, time, my walls are well built up. It's going to take some man to build them back down again. Well, boys, <laughs> drop an email. <laughs> drop an email. <laughs> we, we'll Baron's put you in touch. <laughs> we'll put you in touch. <laughs> but uh, I do hope, and, and you know what? I hope that hasn't completely put. We're not all men are like that. I can guarantee it. And Aye. what I also hope is if the good ones come back. <laughs> don't you sabotage it either oh here don't I've, I've had a few men saying I'm well intimidating but I think that was best down to when I was saying what got me through that was the gym and exercise and yoga and kickboxing and stuff like that so that but, kept me in the but, straight but there is narrow. certain there is certain things that you had said before we had mm-hmm. discussed this here there's yeah. certain things that you put your Copa mind mechanism. to yes yeah. and, and the likes of you're going to the gym and the kickboxing and the whatnot. yeah I, that got me through tough days tough days I remember being in court the time of being in Scotland and coming home and looking forward to the six o'clock class and getting my gloves on and getting on and having, his having, having a couple of fellas around <laughs> 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 a couple of fellas around the sparring yeah <laughs> give them that and, and I know but look I hope for some people there that they take this that the system does in the it end it does work in the end, mm, when you're yes. right, and this is the thing about telling the truth. Yeah, it might take time, mm-hmm. but your story will never change. No, no. And whatever he'll try and paint, and whatever he'll try and do, that that always changes because the lies modify. Yeah. But the truth always maintains. I want to thank you for coming up, and also yeah. want to thank your daughter for whoever was listening to us to put you on us. <laughs> oh, she's raging. She's in school. I'm <laughs> just getting all here. She's... We've got a wee thing for you to bring home. <laughs> <laughs> she went out that door sulking the day, not speaking to me at all, because I wouldn't let her to stay off school uh, to come well, and see. You. <laughs> the next time she's down in Kirkstown, you get around to the studio. But I will do. Definitely, thank definitely. You very much. definitely. Thank you very much Actually, for having me on the much. show. I just hope it makes helps it will. in some it way. Will. There's no doubt. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. No worries. <laughs>